AFP has deigned to join us. I know, it's the tag team. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the State Department. I have a few things at the top. First, on Burma. We're concerned by reports of a spike in violence in Burma's Rakhine State. We're following the situation closely and attempting to get reliable information about developments there. I note that the U.S. Ambassador to Burma, Scott Marcial, along with a visiting delegation of officials from the State Department as well as other U.S. agencies, held a previously scheduled bilateral dialogue with the government of Burma today in Nepetau. Delegation included the Deputy Assistant Secretaries from both the East Asian and Pacific Affairs Bureau as well as the Democracy, Human Rights and Labor Bureau. The U.S. delegation stressed the need for the government of Burma to facilitate a credible and independent investigation of these allegations, to improve transparency and information sharing, and to provide access for both media as well as humanitarian aid. Uh, we note the recent visit to Rakhine State by Ambassador Marcial and other representatives was a positive step in improving international access, but it's important for the government to do more to stem the violence and provide assistance to those in these <coughs> affected areas. Next, a quick update on the Secretary's travel. As you've seen, Secretary Kerry met with the Emirati Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed, as well as National Security Advisor Sheikh Tahoun bin Zayed Al Nahyan in Abu Dhabi today. He's now headed to Marrakesh, where he'll participate in the 22nd Conference of the Parties, COP22, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. While at COP22, Secretary Kerry will deliver a speech that highlights the urgency of addressing climate change and the importance of a continued ambitious climate action around the world. And with that, Matt. Can I just start ask you very briefly on your uh, Burma of um, statement? Who, who exactly did this delegation meet with? So it met with, let me see if I've got this. So it was with their counterparts, with the Burmese government. So it's ministries of border affairs, home affairs, and foreign affairs. Separately, they also met with a host of local NGO, um, and they've also met separately with officials from Rakhine State. But they haven't met with anyone from the military? Um, at this stage, I've got border affairs, home affairs, and foreign affairs, they, as well as the office of the state. Council. Do you think that they got to meet with the right people? I think that they engaged with the interlocutors that they felt were important there. If they did meet with the military, I can, I can update you on that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> moving on. Yeah. This is the, you're going to be your daily question here. Any contact from the transition team? Yet? Um, as of this morning, we have no update to offer you. We have no contact to report. No, okay, none at all that you're aware of. And Correct. That, uh, uh, and, okay. All right, then, unless anyone has questions about that. that is that normal? That at this stage, you would not have had contact with the transition um, we, team? We discussed this yesterday. You know, it's up to the president-elect and his team. Um, you know, we stand ready to welcome them, provide, you know, the briefing materials, the facilitation as we look towards inauguration in January. I, I guess one other question would be, though, you, so you don't see this as being a, some kind of a snub or Oh, absolutely not. Or, no, okay. Absolutely. Um, Can I just follow up on But it seems like it's not only with the State Department, but also with the Pentagon and even the White House. There, there is no, you know, been no contact between the transition. Well, I would team. direct you to the president-elect's I mean, just going back no. to the nor normals here this time. Well, I would direct you to the president-elect's team. You know, we stand ready to support. We look forward to having those discussions. Can I um, change to uh, the subject of Yemen? Of course. Um, the secretary in his comments to people, uh, to reporters in, um, in Abu Dhabi earlier today, talked about the, getting an agreement mm -hmm. um, on a ceasefire to start on uh, 17th, whatever day mm -hmm. of the week that is. Um, but immediately afterwards, the Yemeni government, President Hadi's government, said, what? Basically, so, uh, we're not on board with this. And I'm just wondering, was this premature that uh, what the secretary announced? No, I, I wouldn't say it was premature at all. If people miss this, the secretary actually made these remarks this morning, um, our time in Abu Dhabi. You know, as we all know, the secretary continues to actively engage the parties in the conflict to bring the fighting to an end. It's part of this sustained effort in Muscat uh, yesterday, actually very early this morning, Secretary Kerry met with members of the Houthi delegation in a push to make progress into restoring, uh, resolving the conflict in Yemen. Um, as the Secretary said in his remarks to the press, the Houthis 
have indicated a willingness to abide by the terms of the April 10th cessation of hostilities on the condition that other parties abide by that commitment as well. Uh, we understand the Saudi-led coalition has also expressed a willingness to return to the cessation. Additionally, the Houthis accepted the UN-drafted roadmap as a basis for negotiations to end the conflict to work for the establishment of a new national unity government. In terms of your question, in terms of the, the Yemeni government, uh, we continue to support the UN Special Envoy's work. This is his role as he seeks to negotiate the details of this solution moving forward. In terms of the um, interactions that he's had directly with the government of Yemen, I'd point you to the UN Special Envoy. Okay, so then the, you're saying that he did not um, exaggerate or, uh, because he said only that the Houthis had agreed. And no, we, we believe that um, that for, for the reaction of the government of Yemen, as I said, I'm going to point you to the special envoy. We believe that we have an agreement on the UN roadmap. You know, we continue, we continue though to urge the Republic of Yemen to support this roadmap, to agree to those terms. As you noted, the 17th is, is been posited as a start date. We continue to work on the granularity of that. Right, but it's not, not all parties have agreed to it. Um, we believe that we have a <clears throat> path towards the parties um, agreeing. I note the Yemeni government's reaction to yeah. this this morning. So not all parties have agreed to it, correct? We believe we have a good start towards it, correct. Sorry? Correct. Correct. Yes. Not all parties have agreed We've to it. We've seen the Yemeni government's reaction. They, right, they yes. rejected it. So why, yeah. I mean, so can, we you, have can you just, days can, I'm just looking to, short, I'm looking to, for some week. kind of acknowledgement from you guys that it's all is not well and good with the ceasefire in no. Yemen yet because not everyone has agreed to it. No, and, and I think what we explained is part of the Secretary's remarks and what I've just said is that we've made enormous progress. We think that this provides an opening. We're looking towards November 17th as that time. We continue to engage with the UN Special Envoy as he works to bring all parties okay, to the table. But you do acknowledge that President Ahadi's government needs to be brought on board still. I saw those remarks, yes. Does that mean, yes, you, you accept that yes. the government has yet to agree? I, I believe that is correct. Thank you. And Elizabeth, did you think that the secretary uh, coordinated with the, with the government before his announcement or not? And do you think that there is a coordination between the Saudis and that and the government, the Yemeni government in this regard too? Okay, so in terms of the coordination between the Saudis and that government, I'd refer you to those parties. Where we are working is with the UN Special Envoy in his role to facilitate the communication between the parties. But how can he announce uh, such an agreement or What he announced was that we had made significant progress towards that roadmap, towards the UN roadmap, looking at November 17th, 8th, that he had had constructive engagements with the Houthis about this, um, and that we believe there's a path forward. But it's not, uh, this issue is not related to the Houthis only. Well, no, of course, and that's what we've said, and we continue to work with the UN Special Envoy as he continues to talk with all parties to move towards that November 17th. And why don't you talk to the uh, Yemeni government directly as, as the Secretary talked to the Houthis directly? So the conversation that the Secretary had with the Houthis was to talk about that UN roadmap. In terms of conversation directly with the Yemeni government, we believe that's the role of the UN Special Envoy and we direct you that. And it's not the role of the UN Special Envoy to talk to the Houthis too? But we believe that it was important to talk to the, the Houthis as we move forward and try and move to that 17th to get that cessation of, hosti of, of hostilities, to create a roadmap going forward under the UN auspices. As you know, the Houthis get significant uh, support from Iran. Uh, has the Secretary been in touch with Foreign Minister Zarif? I have no calls to read out on that. So you don't know then if the Houthis' main sponsor is also on board. It's not just the Yemeni government that is not yet on board, but we don't know whether they're... Uh, the Secretary had direct engagement with the Houthis um, regarding the path forward on this. They've accepted the UN roadmap as right. the path forward, so, so we take their word for it. Do you happen to know how many times the Secretary's had direct contact with this with the Houthis? Um, actually, Houthi I don't. I, I, I do note it's unusual. I can check that. It's 
Yeah, I'm not, I, I don't know that he's ever had himself. I know that there have been contacts, but is yeah. it, is I, this I the first? I don't believe that, um, but we'll check, and if, if he has before, then I'll get back to you. What did he meet with them, in uh, Oman or UAE? He met with them last night, so that was in Oman. Wow. And do you have the names on of the, repre the Houthi representatives? I do not. Why don't we go to Syria? A quick yeah. on, of course, on Yemen. Right. I'm just confused. Try to clarify. Uh, the 17, the date of the November 17. Mm -hmm. who, who proposed it? You know, I believe this came out actually of the discussions that the secretary had, noting, as Matt has pointed out, that there's still some granularity that there's work to do moving towards that that cessation. Uh, but we believe we have a path forward on this. And Where was it would... premature? Do you think? Sorry. No, I, I don't believe it was premature. I think I think with the Houthis' agreement on this, this was a significant step. Are we moving to Syria? Go Can ahead. Syria. Yeah. Uh, could you update us? Uh, apparently, the Russians resumed bombardment of, of Idlib and these areas, although not in the Aleppo area. Could you first update us on what the situation is and you know, if there has been any kind of contact? With the Russians uh, on this issue. Okay, so we have seen that we strongly condemn the resumption of airstrikes in Syria by the Russians as well as the Syrian regime. Uh, the most recent reported attacks are on five hospitals and one mobile clinic in Syria. We believe it's a violation of international law. It's also worth noting, and I would say this as an aside, but noting our, our focus has been on the delivery of aid, is that despite Russian claims that it halted airstrikes in the past month. Russia allowed no aid or food into East Aleppo. It let Eastern Aleppo residents starve while seeking praise from the international community for halting indiscriminate strikes for three weeks. You know, we have consistently tried to work to de-escalate the violence in Syria. We're at the table again in Geneva on that today. Um, and we've consistently pushed for the provision of humanitarian aid to these civilians suffering under siege. Instead of joining us constructively to reach that goal, Russia again has backed the Assad regime in their ruthless war against the Syrian people. You're saying that they have halted aid during the, the They the did not time. permit so the facility. How, 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 did they do, how did they do that physically? I mean, did they? like uh, have barricades and they stop you know in terms the, of in, they they you know, did not facilitate the, roads and, the access right. they worked right. with their partners in the regime to block the aid okay. there are also reports that, hold uh, on one entire, second then. yeah you yeah, go ahead and i'll follow up on you i mean what specifically did russia do in this latest uh bombing campaign that you're saying is a violation of international law well, it's, we're, we're taking a look at what Russia is hitting. It's hitting mobile clinics. It's hitting hospitals. You know, again, it's denying aid. Um, we've said this repeatedly. You know, Russia had an opportunity here to facilitate um, aid and food and medicine to these people under siege. Um, it failed to do so. But is the, is when you're saying it's a violation of international law. Are you talking about something they have specifically done as part of this resumption of airstrikes, whether it's the, the hitting of, of hospitals, or are you saying this is just what they've the been set, up to? The set of actions that they have taken with it over the last the many weeks. Yes. Sorry. For the UN. Are you surprised? <laughs> you know, we've talked a lot about um, Russia's actions and, and their words. You know, Russia um, for three weeks made a significant point of saying that it had halted um, bombardment of Aleppo um, and had, you know, broadcast that through its various mm -hmm. platforms and various outlets. You know, the resumption of airstrikes today, I won't say is a surprise, it's certainly a disappointment. But um, they did say that, that, they, that these pauses were temporary <clears throat> in nature and they kept being yeah, extended with, with and the then, idea that it would be for aid, access, right? And then which it, did not happen, right? And then, and then they did tell or make the announcement that everyone should 
leave yeah. that part of the city. That mm -hmm. doesn't make it any, that doesn't mitigate you know, warning it. Warning civilians that you're going to bomb them doesn't make bombing civilians. I, I'm not suggesting that it does. I'm mm -hmm. just asking you that, it, it, that you, you don't think that that's a mitigating factor. Hold on. One, one second, Leslie. I want to go to Saeed because we can. Very quickly. Now, they're making separation between bombing Aleppo and bombing Idlib. You don't make that separation. You think that's part of we the, think bombing the same civilians. campaign? Yes. Yeah, but it, it's, it's one, it's part of the same campaign, yes. the same Russian aerial bombardment campaign. And my last uh, question is, it seems that areas under government control is also suffering from lack of aid and so on, according to the United Nations. Do you have any information on that? I, no, I don't. That, you know, on that, that would be best a question for the UN. You know, civilians need aid, period. Leslie, I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, have you raised um, uh, um, your thoughts with the Russians, if you are talking in You know, so Geneva? we continue to have these discussions in Geneva. What, was it raised with them then? Yes. It was? Yes. So, and, okay. Mm -hmm. Today? We met in Geneva. Today. The issue of um, the issue of the possibility of strikes. You know, I'm not sure on the timing because I believe the strikes happened while they were still meeting in Geneva. We've raised the issue of bombardment. Let me check the exact timing and see if it came up today. Okay. Well, well, but wait, but I mean, you can't. You yeah, so say we were meeting in Geneva. We talked about. There was the a issue. meeting underway when the when the resumption. Of I the want to check happened. the exact timing on that. Okay. okay. Are we done on Syria? Well, I just want to go back to the not the point that I made yesterday, but my question from yesterday: If they were in fact in the middle mm -hmm. of a meeting. How can you say that these meetings are accomplishing anything when, in the middle of it, the bombardment resumes? Yeah, we believe that Russia and the Syrian regime's actions are inexcusable. However, we still believe that the only way forward is a political resolution, and that resolution will happen through multilateral talks. Right, but these multilateral talks are not aimed at a political resolution. They're, I thought they were aimed at trying to get the ceasefire back. It right is up. a ceasefire, a I delivery, know. creating the these space meetings, to have that political resolution. But the resolution. meetings in Geneva are not aimed mm -hmm. at, I mean, they are ultimately aimed at they restarting are. the political talks. But in the immediate term, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be for the ceasefire. That's correct, right? but we do view this as a I, sequence I, of steps. I, I get that, but you're still saying that these meetings are worthwhile, and we I do. don't understand how you can say that if in the very middle of the meeting mm -hmm. the attacks begin again. We continue to believe it's important to talk. Okay. And when will you be ready to, to withdraw from the state? I'm not going to get ahead of that, Misha. One more. Well, I, I was trying to figure out. Um, can we just clarify, uh, at what level are these discussions? They're again? working so level. If you say, uh, yeah. I mean, is, is uh, Ratney there? Is, is a special envoy there? At this there? stage, it's, it's working level discussions. Um, it's my understanding that the special envoy is not in Geneva right now. What are the achievements of, this, of these meetings or of these groups? You know, we talked about this at length yesterday. But we didn't get it yet. If, if there is no results yet and they are still meeting, what's the purpose of meeting without achieving anything. You know, we, we actually spent about 20 minutes unpacking this yesterday. You know, we are not saying that um, these discussions in Geneva are coming to an immediate conclusion or an immediate win, but we continue to believe that this is the best path forward is a discussion in a multilateral setting and we'll stay at the table until we believe it's not the case. The U.S. Ambassador in Iraq visited Erbil over the weekend. He did. Could you give us a readout on his meetings, please? I did. Um, I believe um, you might have seen the embassy in Baghdad actually issued a statement on this today, but I'm happy to recap it. Ambassador Suleiman did visit the Iraq Kurdistan region um, yesterday. The ambassador was accompanied by the Deputy Special Presidential Envoy for the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL, Terry Wolf. Uh, the ambassador met separately with President Barzani and other IKR officials to discuss progress in the battle against Daesh, U.S. support for the Peshmerga, and the IDP situation in the area. The ambassador praised the sacrifices and the bravery of the Peshmerga and thanked the leaders for their support of the more than one million IDPs and refugees who have come to the IKR. Ambassador Suleiman also encouraged the Kurdish, Kurdish leaders to continue what we see as productive dialogue between Erbil and Baghdad to address outstanding issues. 
And w while he was there, mm -hmm. he, he gave a press conference. He asked, uh, answered a reporter's question saying he was confident that Peshmerga first forces would return to their pre-ISIS positions once uh, ISIS is defeated. Mm -hmm. um, was that just an opinion he was expressing or a formal policy that you intend to well, enforce? Well, I think we've spoken about this before. The, the Peshmerga themselves have said that, and we would hold them to their word. Well, the, there are kind of changing circumstances in that a lot has happened, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of animosity. In fact, you know, the CIA director, uh, John Brennan, has expressed skepticism that Iraq can ever be put back together again. And I'm wondering, you know, if, that, if you still remain firmly committed to that or there's room for negotiations between No, we Baghdad? remain firmly committed to that. Do you think that will continue in the new administration? Again, I would refer you to the president-elect's team to discuss any of his policies for the next administration. Can I go to the Palestinian Sure. Leader? Very quickly, I have a quick question. We discussed this a couple of weeks ago. I think Matt prayed that on the, you know, uh, um, barring BDS uh, supporters and so on from entering Israel. Uh -huh. Well, it passed its first reading yesterday and so on. And in fact, they were called by former uh, Israeli Minister of Justice Livni, Tzibi Livni, uh, called it McCarthyism and we should allow everybody in, and that would actually help uh, the BDS movement. Do you have any comment on all this? I mean, you know, I know you said that you don't interfere, but mm -hmm. I, want, I wanted to know if you do well, have I, I a position. I, yeah, I'd reiterate what I think it was Mark who briefed that day where we spoke about this. You know, we're aware of the various reactions um, to the proposed bill to bar pro-BDS activists from entering Israel. Uh, we understand. I'd also note that the legislation requires several more steps before becoming law. Um, the United States' strong opposition to boycott and sanctions of the State of Israel is well known. However, as a general principle, we value freedom of expression, even in cases where we do not agree with the views espoused. Um, in terms of where the legislation is and the local reaction in the Israeli community, I'd refer you to Israel. What should, let's say, uh, uh, Americans of Palestinian descent that are active in, in, in these issues, when they go to the tent, they land at Tel Aviv airport and so on, and they're barred from entering the country or, or held, what should, what should they do? What, what should the what do you advise them to do well, in I this case? Well, I think we've spoken about this before, right. and we've spoken about um, our conversations with Israel on treating all Americans equally on that. And, and while every country has a right to control its borders, you know, we certainly support the freedom of expression, even when we don't agree with the policy. Thank you. Is that on uh, the U.S. Uh, tanks that appeared in the... The Antarctic armored one? personnel carriers? Yeah. yeah. Any, any update on it? So we actually have been looking into it, so thanks for that, because I did want to update you. Um, we take any allegations of end use violations seriously in Lebanon, in Syria, anywhere around the world. Our embassy in Beirut is working with the Lebanese armed forces to investigate the images circulating on social media purporting to show Hezbollah displaying U.S. military equipment in Syria. Uh, we note that the Lebanese military has publicly stated that the M113s depicted online in the Hezbollah military parade were never part of their equipment roster. Uh, we'd also note the vehicles in the photos that you can see circulating on Twitter are extremely common in the region. The M113s are old. They're found in a number of different countries' militaries um, in the region. Identifying their origin is difficult, something that we have not yet assessed exactly at this period of time. However, we continue to work closely with our colleagues within the Pentagon and the intelligence community, and we'll update you either later this week or later as soon as we come to a conclusion. And so what countries have yeah. in there? What countries in the um, region? So I actually, I asked that, and apparently it's a number of countries in the, in the region, and these apparently also, it's things I did not know about M113s, is they can last for decades. They, they can last upwards, you know, 40, 50 years. So as we continue to take a look at these images that we're circulating on social media, you know, we'll drill down. We'll see if we can identify it by the configurations of the tanks, things right. like that. Well, bravo. I'm glad that they last long. It's another testament to American manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Buy America. Uh, 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 exactly. Well, 
So Hezbollah should buy American, is or that not. what you're saying? Yeah. Well, wait a second. I, yeah. You say a number of countries. Yeah. Can you name them or at least yeah. give... You know, uh, at this stage, I don't want to get ahead of it because well, how many, we're still looking... What's the number? Yeah, I will say several. We're still Three, looking... Three, four, five? I'm not going to characterize it. It's not like... Well, then how, how, how can we call it it's a number of countries? Yeah. And then I, as soon as we have more granularity, more details, but I will say, as I mentioned yesterday, um, that we're actively looking at this. It's, it is of concern as end use is anywhere around the world. And as soon as I have something more, I'll update I you think guys. Israel has some, I think they're probably unlikely to be has below supply. Is it, is, is it conceivable that uh, they are actually old Iranian? Thanks from the shop. I mean, again, you know, I, I'm just do, not do in a position that? to. Do you suspect that there may have been old Iranian uh, tanks that have found their way to Lebanon? Again, I'm not in a position to, to sort of judge hypotheticals at that. We're looking into it as soon as I have an update. You guys will get it. Did the U.S. deliver uh, such uh, arms to, to, Iraq, to the Iraqi government? Again, Later? you know, we're taking a look. We'll get back to you as soon as we have more, Michelle. Anything? Yes. Or, or the, the other question, does yeah, the Iraqi government have the same kind of, uh, of tanks? You know, these are questions in terms of um, that sort of capability that as we take a look at, at the photos that were circulating on social media, we'll be able to narrow it down. I just don't have an answer for you. Uh, so, uh, Kirby told us that uh, the ICC has made a valuable contribution to the service of accountability in a number of situations. Uh, this is in reference to African countries, uh, a handful of them uh, withdrawing cooperation from the from the ICC. Now the uh, chief prosecutor, uh, Fatou Bensouda, says she's investigating uh, U.S. military and the CIA for potential war crimes in Afghanistan. Will you cooperate with this investigation? Do you find it helpful, a uh, valuable contribution to the service of accountability? So I think you're talking about the preliminary examination report of the Office of the Prosecutor. Um, you know, obviously we're aware of the report. Um, I'd note the United States is deeply committed to complying with the law of war. We have a robust national system of investigation and accountability that is as good as any country in the world. We do not believe that an ICC examination or investigation with respect to the actions of U.S. personnel in relation to the situation in Afghanistan is warranted or appropriate. As we previously noted, the United States is not a party to the Rome Statute and has not consented to ICC jurisdiction. Is that the reason that it's inappropriate? Because we, you're not a member? For that and for other reasons, we um, do not believe it's warranted or appropriate. Well, you know, Sudan says that it, Sudan is not a member. You know, and what it says, and it says that uh, the indictment of its president is not appropriate or warranted. What's the difference? Well, we have a robust system of accountability. You know, it is longstanding U.S. policy, and you guys see this every day. You know, Kirby, I think, of anyone, uh, it speaks about the accountability of U.S. military systems. The when credible allegations of wrongdoing by U.S. forces are made, an investigation is undertaken, so appropriate actions um, may be may be taken. So the reason that this is not hypocritical is because one, you're not a member. And two, you conduct investigations and hold people accountable on your own and don't need the International Criminal Court. Well, as you said, Good. we're not a member. We're not subject to ICC jurisdiction. And we also do have a robust system right. of national accountability. So I think you're, you're saying Correct. yes. That those those are the reasons. One, you're not a member. And two, you handle these kinds of investigations on your own. Correct. But... <clears throat> I don't understand how uh, those two those two things. I mean, there are lots of countries that aren't members. Um, and when you say that, when you say that it, it's a bad thing or a negative thing for for African countries to want to leave because they think it's unfair, and then say, and then give this as your reasoning for why it's inappropriate for the ICC to look into these allegations, do you not see how that opens the way opens the door to? Um, well, I would um, say, you know, as we people said, people saying that you're that, there, that there's a double standard here. Well, we have engaged with the ICC, um, and we've supported ICC investigations and prosecution of cases that we believe advance um, our values um, in accordance with U.S. law. 
Um, you know, I understand your point, but we hold ourselves accountable more than, I wouldn't say more than any other country, but we hold ourselves to the highest possible standards when it comes. We believe that we have national systems of accountability that are more than sufficient. There, there's been critici criticism, though, uh, of the national system of accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you, and you, you reject no, that we, as being unfair we, um, criticism? You know, what I would say is that we do an extraordinary job of investigating and of holding those accountable, um, investigating credible allegations, in, um, holding ourselves accountable, holding our personnel accountable, and um, closing investigations um, in a manner that serves justice. So these, these specific allegations that the prosecutors say that they were looking into, people have been held, uh, there have been investigations and people have been held accountable for? On specific investigations on issues like that, um, especially the ones in this report, I am going to have to refer you to the Department of Defense. I can speak broadly about our view on this report. Right, but the you're saying that the ICC doesn't need to or shouldn't investigate this because the U.S. has its own system. So I'm, We know. have extensively examined the conduct of our armed forces in Afghanistan. And example. determined what? Um, we have made public reports on detention operations. We um, have extensively examined our own activities. We have been as transparent as, as possible. Right, but the findings were and people were I, or were not held accountable for In any, many cases, any, people any were abuses. held accountable. They yes. were. Okay. Yeah. I'm no. sorry. Dave. Yeah, so you said that you have in the past cooperated with some ICC investigations into other countries where you see an opportunity to advance American values. Correct. So you're selectively using the ICC as a tool of foreign policy rather than as justice. No, I would say that we, as I said, that we cooperate with the ICC, we support the ICC. We believe the ICC, as we have made clear, investigation of other countries. We have, we have supported the ICC when we believe in cases, for example, of accusations of genocide, mm -hmm. um, where, where you have these grave violations of, of um, you know, grave atrocities on this. But we're not a signatory to the Rome Statute. We are not members. We have our own system of accountability. And does that undermine your case for asking, for example, African countries to? We raise our with concerns um, when countries. But your concerns bear little weight, since you yourself would not put yourself under the jurisdiction. Well, when we did raise concerns, we've always been clear that we ourselves are not signatories. Mm -hmm. You were a signatory. Well, we, a ratifier. not a ratifier. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have. Uh, I don't more. know if this was addressed before. Um, maybe you did, or there was a statement over the weekend, and I missed it. But Hong Kong. Um, I haven't. So, yes. so if you if you want to ask uh, about that, the, the mm -hmm. removal of these uh, legislatures on the oath issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are aware of reports that a Hong Kong court has disqualified two legislator elects who altered the wording of their it's legislators. What elect. did I say? Legislators. Like did a, I put the it, plural on the it's wrong? It's like attorneys general. Thank you. Legislators elect who altered the wording of their oaths of office. The United States strongly supports and values Hong Kong's legislative council and independent judiciary, two institutions that play a critically important role in promoting and protecting the special administrative region's high degree of autonomy under basic law and the one country, two systems framework that has been in place since 1997. We believe that an open society with the highest possible degree of autonomy and governed by the rule of law is essential for Hong Kong's continued stability and prosperity as a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. Okay, maybe I missed it. So you think that you don't you don't like this action by the court? We believe that the Chinese and the Hong Kong um, SAR government and all elected politicians in Hong Kong should refrain from any actions that fuel concern or undermine confidence in the one country, two systems principle. So does that mean that you that altering the oath you're opposed to, or that the court stripping them uh, of the of their office is, 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 is a concern. Which? Or both? Both. 
So you we, don't like we, the fact that they changed the oath, and you don't like the fact that the that the uh, that the court ruled the way it did. We we believe that actually both. So one, it was an independent. Um, the independent legislative council, the independent judiciary, we believe played that important role, but we also call on both the Hong Kong politicians as well as the Chinese government. Can I have a quick Hong Kong sure. question? Uh, the student advocate, Joshua Wong, is coming in Washington, and he's supposed to uh, be in Congress tomorrow. Is there any plan from this building? Anyone is meeting with him? I have no, I have no meetings to read out for, for his visit. If that changes, I'll let you know. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Legislators.